Well, good evening and welcome to this live stream on the 26th of December 2023. It's Martin North here from Digital Finance Analytics. Great to have you on the show tonight. And uh, I have Tony LaCrantro teed up and ready to come in in just a second. Just before I do that, uh, I will just remind you, of course, as always, that uh, we're not providing financial or legal advice. So it's a general conversation only this evening. So we do moderate the chat, so please play nice. This is as of the 26th of December 23, if you're watching in replay. If you'd like to ask a question, and questions are very much encouraged, use at Walk the World to make sure that I see them. It goes into a separate queue, and uh, that means that gets to my attention. I've also enabled Super Chat, which means that you can get your question to the top of the list or indeed make a contribution to what we do around here. Always greatly appreciated. And uh, we do this not because of any profit motive, but because we think there's a really important conversation to have. Anyway, with that introduction out of the way, I'm going to push this button and hopefully Tony will appear and uh, join us. Tony, how are you doing? Oh, very, very good, Martin. And again, thanks for everyone to, for showing up on, on, on Boxing Day. Uh, hopefully everyone's had a, a safe Christmas. No one's been charged with uh, drink driving or gotten into a fracas. Uh, maybe a little bit of a fracas in the chat room. Uh, everyone will play nice, but yeah, I'm, I'm doing well, and I'm I'm going to go into 2024 with a lot of enthusiasm and hope after two two tough years for me. But uh, I guess it depends on where you are in the economic cycle as to how you're positioned for next year. But um, well, thank God this one's almost over. It's it's been a shocker on, on a number of fronts, and. Uh, yeah, looking forward to get stuck into it, Martin, and hopefully provide some insights where some money perhaps can be made and or protected, because I think protecting capital is going to be a key theme. And it's interesting, Tony, because I've had a number of questions beforehand, uh, and pretty much to a question, they were all about asset protection. It was all about, given the advanced uncertainty that we've got currently, um, you know, where are things likely to, to play out? And here's just a quick uh, reminder. This is the, um, uh, you know, the 500 in the US. And you can see that basically in the last two years, we've got <laughs> we've gone nowhere, right? So the peak of 2022, we're pretty much back now to to the same level again. And, and so it begs the question, um, you know, are we going to go more of the same? And I guess, um, Tony, from an asset valuation point of view, a lot of assets seem to be quite overvalued relative to perhaps fundamentals. So that might also suggest that there are some risks around, but also, of course, opportunities if you know where to, to look. So this is why it's so confusing. Absolutely. And we're, we're saying uh, I'll, I'll present some slides which show just how irrational things have become. Uh, once you're in a bit of an uptrend, I guess those think that these things can go on forever. And that's that's the time when it only takes a small break and all bets are off because generally there's no friends when it comes to money. As I keep saying, if you're going to panic, panic first. And I, I just think we're in for tumultuous times. And if you look back over history, that even though they're talking about rate cuts in the US, that is a, the time when markets actually start to fall. So I, I'd treat rate cuts with, with a lot of trepidation indices uh, markets this year have defied all expectations i mean they're up 20 about 20 percent s p's one percent off its high from january 2022 and interestingly the russell index of small caps has turned around a bit and is up 15.8 percent for the year thus far so i'm hoping for a bit of a turnaround in small caps a return to fundamentals and that there's always a chance that we might move into a fabulous market and by a fabulous market, I mean where there's no speculative further. Uh, markets always are driven by fear, greed, and stupidity. But I think we FOMO might disappear. Everyone might be more cautious, and we can just get back to bloody fundamentals, fundamental value, value takeovers, corporate activity. Let's get back to some form of normality because this year has just been the year of M and A, uh, Gina Reinhart and Twiggy have gone absolutely apeshit on a, trying to acquire not only lithium assets but clothing companies as well and buildings. So I know the AFR voted Gina, the business person, woman of the year. So, again, looking to what she does, but 
you know, always got to be cautious following the money in potentially uh, when she may have, may have rang the bell, especially in lithium. So, look, there's a lot to get through, a lot to look forward to, a lot of opportunity, and I really look forward to sharing it with our viewers tonight. Excellent, Tony. Well, um, we'll uh, get uh, you to set yourself up uh, ready to go. Um, share your screen again and uh, we can uh, then get started. I will remind you that um, Douglas Adams had a wonderful line in the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy as the infinite improbability drive was was turned down. And at, some po at one point, he basically said, normality has been restored. Anything else now is your own problem, <laughs> right? And I can't help feeling that I'm not sure oh, no. that normality's yet been restored, right? We've had this huge flood of stimulus money post-COVID, um, you know, very low interest rates. So the money supply went through the roof. Um, that created a bunch of inflation. Inflation is sort of coming down, but it's coming down a bit sort of wobbly. And particularly services inflation is still quite strong, Um a lot of people are saying that the last mile between where inflation is and where it needs to get to to meet those targets are actually going to be quite difficult. And um, meanwhile, of course, the markets are, as you say, banking on significant rate cuts uh, through 2024, despite the fact that central bankers now walking back that a little bit and saying, oh, maybe <laughs> maybe not too many. Mm -hmm. So I don't know what normal is anymore, uh, Tony. I don't know whether you do, but <laughs> it's, it's an interesting question. Yeah, normal, a normal market for me. Um, Christmas cracker indeed. So that was um, my our dinner last night. Uh, as everyone knows, I'm, I'm a carnivore, so we went went ate shit on the the lamb cutlets, scallops, and and some prawns. So that's how uh, a simple celebration. No no retail therapy for me. I've um, uh, curbed my addiction to sugar and spending money on useless things. Uh, unfortunately, 90% uh, of my wardrobe has gone to charity. Uh, actually, I was walking uh, back from the gym and I saw a, an elderly man wearing what I believe to be one of my um, shirts. So, yeah, I've had to um, find some bargains around and, uh, and move on. So that's the all-important disclaimer. I'm going to be making some forward-looking statements I'm going to present what I believe to be the highest quality companies of my stable. And just remember, you know, I'm not making personal advice. You need to seek your own advice and your risk tolerance because I know, I know that the last two years, uh, you know, I can only describe it as being um, shithouse. Maybe personally I've, um, I've picked up in 2023. I think that's, that's the underlying theme of what Australians are going through and what's certainly in store. And that's really sad. Uh, we hear a lot of talking about cost of living pressures, the cost to, to feed a family, uh, levels of shoplifting near all time highs. Um, they're targeting meat and razor blades and other and ram raids uh, to get tobacco that can be easily on sold. But uh, with mortgage rates, with some families coming off 1.99% straight up to six with a bullet, uh, spending's going to decline. And I know they, they create a lot of fervour around how the shops are full, but I, I think certainly this year maybe families are starting to pare it back. And uh, in, in my household, uh, you know, we, we will celebrate, but there's no, there's no stupid expenditure now. you just got to be careful with with how you spend. And I think I stole, I've stolen some slides off you, Martin, I hope you don't mind. So that that's showing that um, interest rates aren't gonna be lower for longer, they're gonna be higher for longer. And often, often in the comments uh, of some of our previous interviews, I read that uh, the belief was that interest rates will never rise again in our lifetime. And uh, I, I just think that's stupidity. Uh, but interestingly, as we harp on, Martin, the long-term RBA cash rate is between 6 and 6.5%. Six Mortgage rates on average up until the COVID schmozzle have been in the 9% range. So, so we're still not quite there yet to reaching the long-term average. 
And if you look at someone owing $800,000 at 9%, that's $72,000 pre-tax. I don't know where the hell people are going to find it. Uh, already, Uber drivers in New Zealand are complaining about their hourly rates falling. That would indicate that consumers are cutting back and the roads are being flooded. So, you know, New Zealand has been a bit of a leader with their property and what they're going through in, in the economy. So that is a very ugly chart for anyone looking for relief. And, and I think families just simply have to hang on. Uh, you can cut out all your streaming services. Uh, that's just like throwing sand into a cyclone as far as I'm concerned. And if you haven't sold all your toys yet, um, the door's shut. I mean, you, you've got to look at what secondhand goods are worth these days and it's two fifths of bugger all. So again, I don't like the look of that chart. Another one I stole from you, uh, mortgage stress, another ugly chart. Uh, that's from October and that just keeps creating highs. And you know, you've got to look at rental stress as well. Uh, I've met people here that can't find anywhere to live. Uh, you're looking at laws around pets, uh, but I guess it's all in favor of the landlord these days. They can decide who gets the house, people forcing to bid over. And this rental crisis has gone on. And especially in Perth, we see uh, car parks in quite affluent areas where they're turning into mini tent cities. And that's that's just sad. And again, it's I feel as though it's only going to get worse as per that interest rate chart. Another one, oh, those, those numbers are beyond beyond scary now. I look at WA, look at the rental stress, you look at the mortgage stress up around 50%. Uh, again, families hanging on for grim death. Do they start to talk to their banks, uh, try, try and get a deal done? Or do they simply put their hands up and, and, and give up and maybe sell when there's a chance of copying some loss? But again, uh, they're going to owe the bank that money and they can give some grace, but I just I just don't think that um, the longer you put it off, it, it's typical head in the sand. And I think families should have should now be getting used to what what we're going through. Just and interestingly, uh, school fees at private schools in Perth now, many of the top schools, it's over thirty thousand dollars per child um, for year eleven and year twelve, and they're they're going up at about the rate of inflation. So. I guess the next stage we'll see kids being tugged from um, private schools. And I don't see an issue with the public system because, as you know, guys, during a property boom, it doesn't matter which shitty location, there's always a good school. That's um, that's like the funnel. Uh, another one I stole from you, Martin, oh, I just think that, yeah, we all, a lot of us are going through budget pressures. Uh, my income from what I do, which is financial advising, ha has certainly taken a hit. Uh, sadly, I've cancelled our, our trip to Hungary. Um, I'm, I've asked uh, Booking.com for a refund on my business class fares. Again, it just shows you uh, when things are going well or better than where they are now, uh, you're in a different mindset. And I'm thinking, well, I was uh, going to have the extra leg room, proper cutlery and enjoying my first alcoholic drink in over a year, but that's no longer. And I'm doing what most most people would uh, think is stupid. I'm actually flying my mother-in-law over from Hungary and uh, should be a fun-filled three weeks. So that's the pressure families are under. It doesn't matter if you're on 50 grand a year or 200 grand a year. We all tend to spend relative to our income, and once in income takes a hit, we're in a shitload of trouble. This, um, I think this slide just highlights uh, what irrational exuberance is. That's the term Schiller came up with for the, uh, for the NASDAQ.com bubble. And you look at that, the median price in Sydney, just under $1.4 million. Uh, I've put some beautiful suburbs there on the right, that are under a million dollars, um, maybe closely located to, to a meth lab with a chance of a drive-by. 
So that's they are hideous numbers. Uh, and 14, look, I've rounded out price to income at 14 times. And it's like, seriously, guys, what the? Yeah, that's just unbelievable. Uh, you know, in the 70s, three to four times, one income. I know my, my parents bought in Manly Vale at, at three to four times. Coming out of the recession in Bondi, uh, North Bondi, actually, I bought a, a unit for 2.4 times my police salary, which wasn't wasn't much in those days. And now for a unit, one bedroom unit in Bondi, you're paying 12, 12 times. And what do we have? We have deconstructed Vegemite sandwiches and we have the beachfront uh, with a chemist warehouse. So again, you've got to look at long-term ranges. Is this a paradigm shift where houses will be expensive forever? I'm going to suggest not. But in reality, do Sydney and Melbourne prices get back to a six, seven, eight times range uh, similar to where we are in Perth? Uh, you know, there's always going to be that argument that Perth's a backwater. But I, I think Perth, honestly, with supply demand, we have investors buying in suburbs unseen. Uh, Seville Grove was one example. The prices in Kelmscott. Armadale, Camillo have skyrocketed. Uh, again, not, not the strongest socioeconomic areas of Perth, but they have enjoyed strong growth and people are starting to get price out of, priced out of these suburbs. And, you know, you, you look at, um, there's a YouTuber my son follows who goes around to all the hoods. Um, some of them, he went to Mount Druitt and Bidwell and, Shelby in, in Sydney, and these haven't changed. Uh, it's just that prices have escalated and suddenly everywhere's a blue chip suburb. So I, I I think that this is defied gravity for far too long. Interest rates are far too high to support these prices. Inflation remains far too high. There's a lack of disposable income, mortgage stress through the roof. Uh, do we see 12 to 15 percent off? house prices in 2024. I think there's a strong case for that. Same with Melbourne. Uh, Adelaide and Brisbane, obviously a lot lot harder to pick. Um, you know, when the, when the speculative money poured down the East Coast, it, it found Hobart. And Hobart, Tasmanian real estate is, uh, as far as I can see, it's a lobster or a cray pot, depends where you are in Australia. And, and that means easy to get into, damn impossible to get out of. So I think there still might be um, some upside to come in Perth. I know we've got these mortgage corridors uh, north and south of the river, but uh, I could still see a lot of eastern states investors buying up our property and people realising, taking a look over west and realising that we do have electricity, we do have shops, there are jobs if you want to work and it's a bloody nice place to live. So... I still think there's, even though prices within 12 k's of the Perth CBD, I mean, you can live 12 k's to the city, 12 k's to the beach. Um, probably got some room to move, but I still think the switch is switch is viable if you can if you can move. So that's that's my case, and I go back to 14 times, and that's that's just ridiculous. I think aliens and future economic students will be taking the absolute piss out of this generation. And I go back to the great economist, the Irish economist, Morgan Kelly, who came out on an Irish show, debated Jim Power, and he said half price, house prices are going to halve, and the guy was right. And this is the situation. And the hard part is when you're in a bubble, you, the key to real, is realising you're actually in one. So, again, um, it's, that's, it's not good where we're going to end up. That's me, the last two years, um, kind of swiveling on my chair. Uh, tough, tough times, I, I admit. I've, I've been doing financial advising for 25 years. I've had consecutive shockers. Uh, some days I could get up to 100 phone calls. These days, uh, three to five, but I'm expecting some big things to come. And that's me watching uh, Gina Reinhart push the lithium sector higher, 
that's uh, that was created by AI, and that's that's where we've been. It's a case of order envy. Why why I stuck to fundamentally sound companies that have underperformed, struggled struggled to raise money despite having fantastic fundamentals. And I guess uh, you know you can't win every year. It's like you can't win every hand uh, when you're playing blackjack at the casino. But what the last two years have done. They not only taught me some valuable lessons, again, to take profits and don't leave extreme wealth on the table, but to say, well, this is the time when the war stories are created. I, I go back and I look at all my long-term successful people and they bought stocks in the pennies and they managed to hold them. They didn't follow the herd. So what I'm about to do is just, just present a handful. Uh, I don't need to run through everything. I'd, I'd pull most of you to death. But that's what I see. And that's what I see. That, that's the view, no doubt. Um, I've used this slide in the past. It's, it's still one of my favourites. There you go. That's, that's the choice you have. Um, maybe that was a lineup of North Curl Curl in Sydney um, properties when you could buy them at the bottom. Uh, now, now they're all blue chips. So the key to stock selection is to work out who can hold a, an intelligent conversation and isn't going to take eighty percent of your money with a shit ton of child support. So that's that's what I'm presented with now. And, and the tough part, if you look at all asset classes, is deciding portfolio allocation and what hard assets do you look at. I'm a massive fan of silver. Uh, at the moment, it's trading live at about $24.30 an ounce. Gold uh, got up to over 2,100, got slaughtered below 2,000, and is now around $2,062 an ounce. I, I think that silver not only is a store of wealth, uh, it can protect your capital, but it has shown in the past that it can rally strongly. It is a very tight market. And if if the participation rate only increases a couple of points, uh, I, I think it could have a strong rally. It did get around $50 an ounce way back in 2011. And obviously when the Hunt brothers tried to corner the market then, but uh, or, already uh, uranium, up to around $90 a pound. It's been a bit of a bull market by stealth, but they're saying that they're expecting Chinese demand for uranium to increase fivefold. So we've had another run in the majors, uranium. The juniors are starting to play catch up. And I go back to 2005, 2007, when we had the madness of the uranium bubble, prices got up to about $140 a pound. There are a handful of uranium companies. Then suddenly there's hundreds of them all backdooring in these projects. And I, I liken the final stages of a rampant speculative bubble. Uh, you show up at 3 a.m. to a piss up holding a vegan pizza. And again, we're going to see that I think in lithium, where companies now are probably looking for projects on the moon. But in my mind, um, silver hasn't hasn't done a lot. I still go back to the days where Warren Buffett sold all his silver in the falls. I think it was uh, quite a few years ago now because of the threat of digital photography. So there's always going to be threats. There's always going to be something to get you for, to not invest. And that's herd mentality. It's what you read on social media. It's what you hear on the news. But delve, get, get, delve into it, and you'll see opportunity. So here comes some stocks to watch. Uh, Morona Metals. They have a lead, silver, copper, gold deposit. Uh, Nikon Curry. They're getting great shallow lead and silver results. Uh, it's a one-project company based on their existing resource. Oh, I think it's grossly undervalued. They, they lack a profile. Oh, I think they're, they're a corporate target and I look forward to mining studies coming next year. Oh, I should disclose that myself and my kids own a lot of the stock. 
and my clients. I actually helped float this company. I'm surprised it, it hasn't really moved much. But um, again, lead and silver, if you silver it up, I know that's probably the wrong thing to do. It's either a four, about 400 million ounces of, of silver and you can buy it for 30 million, you can buy the whole company for $30 million or it's about a 4 million ounce gold resource. Again, gold equivalent. So it's trading at about $7 an ounce in the ground. And on, I should reiterate that the real value in gold is the enterprise value. So we've got companies with a million ounces in the ground capped at about $10 million. So that's $10 an ounce in the ground. The gold price is not far off record highs, yet gold in the ground in some cases is trading at a quarter of the long-term average. So if that doesn't spell opportunity, I, I give up. Uh, my other joint stock of the year with Moronin is, is Red Metal. They own 50% of Moronin. They have a joint venture with BHP. They're looking for huge deposits. They have made what they what could be a world first rare earths discovery uh, near Mount Isa. Uh, similar leaching potential to the giant uranium mines, and we'll be sweating on those results. So this is a great all-round company. It's been listed for 20 years. Rob Rutherford's run it. I know I talk about this and finitum, but they're due for a break. And what he's done is kept the share structure below 300 million shares. A lot of companies would issue that over a cup of coffee. And the point is they want to become a small company with a big share price. Saturn Metals, this, this company has 1. Uh, 1.84 million ounces in WA. The market cap is far too low. Unfortunately, the share price has moved. And why this stock is cheap, it's got a similar investment theme or similar shareholders to Red Metal Moronin. But what they're looking to do is to treat the gold heap leach uh, in acid, a uh, different method of production, but around 60% of the world's gold comes from heap leach. And I just like the vibe of this stock. I just think that they've already put out a pre-economic study. And I go back and I look at to one of the gold companies I missed in Capricorn. CWM is the code. Pull up a chart of that one. They started with a low-grade deposit, then they moved on. So I, I see, look, high risk, high risk. I can't reiterate that enough, but this, this is quality. For those looking at a, a junior resource company investment vehicle, uh, LSX is listed. So they're trading around 41, 42 cents and their NTA is in the 60s. And I should make it perfectly clear that listed investment companies always trade at a discount and the breakup value of their investments is higher. They have paid a couple of dividends they do invest in seed capital. They take the risks. I like what they've invested in. Recently, they they threw $3 million at Saturn Metals, the, the company I just mentioned, and they're sitting on around a $70 million war chest to come in and scoop up these distressed companies to help them. And that, that to me, is the most conservative vehicle you, you can take in junior resource investment. So, Again, upside with a chance of a dividend. Biotech, uh, biotech stocks have been poleaxed. I have noted that uh, Bristol Myers has just offered $14 billion uh, to buy Karuna in, in the US. That's a company that has a drug to treat schizophrenia. Uh, yeah, $14 billion. The radio pharmaceutical sector is starting to heat up. You're going to see more. M&A in that sector. The biotechs have been absolutely slaughtered and some of them are down 90% from their highs without doing anything wrong. All they've done is put out good news. And one of the themes, guys, I've been through is that capital has been hard to raise. You have to raise, just say a stock's trading at 10, you might have to go in and raise money 
at seven, offer a 30% discount, then suddenly the share price goes to seven and below. So that's what I've been up against for the last two years. I don't think these companies have done too much fundamentally wrong. Uh, Proteomics has a ProMarker D test for diabetic kidney disease that pretty much gives you the risk a few years before it happens. Sonic Healthcare in the US, they've licensed it. It's up to Sonic Healthcare to now sell this in the US. They've expanded into other markets. They have a, a, a diagnostic test for endometriosis, uh, which affects one in nine women. Huge market there. That's showing 90% accuracy. A test for esophageal cancer, again, with 90% accuracy early days. So this could be driven by revenue is one of my higher quality biotech companies. Dimerics, there's been no real advancements in kidney treatment for 20 years. Now they're in phase three of a DMX 200, which is a kidney drug. And they've already signed an alliance uh, for $10.8 million up front. They've received that and up to over $200 million in royalties. Now this offers extreme risk. We're going to have the phase three readout, I believe, on the 15th of March. If that comes in, there is huge upside. Uh, many of you that follow the biotech sector might see what Neuron's done, NEU. They've run from about $2 up to about $23 through success. If, if of course, this drug fails at phase three, um, we're heading to three cents um, like a bullet train. So again, high risk, but you've got to understand that these are quality companies and there's very few juniors, small caps that can get into phase three trials and, or, uh, and already attracting massive attention. And Chimeric, um, as Kamal would say, why are people so unkind? This is this has been um, one of my major disappointments, uh, not through trying, not through putting out good news. Uh, they've they've had to raise money down the S spend, last capital raise at 2.8 cents, massive shortfall. They are looking at treatments for glioblastoma, which is an insidious brain cancer with their therapies. Already the, the clinical trials have suggested that they can extend the lives of these patients, sadly, who are in a bad way, um, give them a few more months of life. Obviously, that needs to develop. They have some exciting prospects of some CAR T therapies that have knocked out seven types of cancers, uh, admittedly, in a test tube in a petri dish. So, you know, again, very high risk and 90% off its highs, maybe 90% and change. I'm also looking at Radio Farm. This is another company, uh, Diamond Diamond Research actually put out uh, evaluation on them at seventy cents. Uh, this is getting rather boring. I, I wish they'd lower that a bit, but again, Radio Pharmaceuticals Imaging, a treatment for prostate cancer. They're looking at obviously high risk, but this is a company that was forced to raise capital at ten cents. It's now actually no, sorry, seven cents. It's now trading around that level, but these are companies that extensive research supports much higher valuations. And this, this is widespread throughout both the gold, base metals, uh, in particular copper. I know I haven't covered copper tonight. So uh, again, there's some stocks to watch. Do your own research. Uh, I've come off a nasty two years with most of them, and I'm expecting hopefully some good announcements to drive them as well. I'm going to give myself a bit of a plug. Uh, one of the one of the viewers and top guys, uh, Ron Osborne, who runs his web design company, has put together a simple website for me. I will have some of my videos below if if you want some insights. Uh, let's call it Lacantro Light. Uh, just register at tonylacantro.com and, and I'll send you some stuff. I try not to spam. You can always unsubscribe. I will be providing some market insights, but it should be noted I stick to my niche. It's hard to predict what big caps are going to do because it's pretty much up or down. On a personal note, um, I've survived 2023 without one alcoholic beverage. 
uh, I'm proud of myself. I've um, adopted the carnival cure lifestyle. That is going fantastic. Uh, I can pretty much taste. I used to love vanilla slices. Um, I can taste them, but I don't need to have it. I've cut out. I've cut out a lot of shit foods. I, I hit the gym. I'm really happy with my transformation, and um, I've cancelled my business class flight to to Budapest. And I've decided, why not? Let's go alcohol free again in 2024. Uh, my fine dining extends to the Epicurean buffet at the casino. Uh, you know, you pay $120, but if you eat 50 oysters, um, you get value for money there. And what I'm saying is uh, I've, I believe that with my regime, with what I'm doing, trying to stay mentally fit, trying to stay mentally on, on top of what's happening in the world, I have um, more ticker than a masala. Anyway, that's all, folks. Tony, thank you very much. And uh, as always, um, your um, inimitable style comes through, but also you make some some really, really, really good points. Um, there were a few questions that came in th in the chat while you were chatting. Um, one I thought was quite interesting, if I can just find it again. It was uh, further up. Yeah, so it was from Cookie Boy. I mean, it was this um, question for both of us. If the Fed cuts, won't that be inflationary? And won't markets then go just on another higher high? Um, what do you think? It can, it can provide uh, a near-term hit of dopamine. And, but what, what you'll find with markets is that the upside can be baked in to a certain extent. Once, once the potential for interest rate cuts are flagged, uh, markets will respond and their markets will lead the, the news. So th th there's obviously a chance of that. The S&P, as I said, is 1% off its January 2022 all-time high. So you might see a burst, but then that's it. I think she'll be out of steam. And, you know, we've had a negative 18% year in the US. We've had a plus 20, 21%. I think then you, you'll start to see that market performances will normalise. And to me, that spells correction. So I, I think, yeah, there might be a rush into the S&P 500 or, or the Dow. Uh, God knows how the Magnificent Seven will react. Uh, well, they've driven markets, as we all know. So I think that could be a case to perhaps average down on some of your anti-US investment vehicles, which sadly haven't performed well at all. Um, and it's been a tough time for anyone anyone on the short side. But um, I see it. Maybe you might get that catalyst for markets to, to have a, a burst. But um, thereafter, history shows us that they, they tend to fall. So I'm just saying it, this might be the buying opportunity for asset classes that, that bet against the US. Yeah, and there's a couple of interesting um, you know, observations there. The first is you're dead right. The markets, of course, uh, position ahead of any cuts or, or any, um, you know, if, if rates come down, they've already taken a position ahead of that. So if you look over the last uh, few cycles, in fact, Markets have performed very badly when cuts start. Now, there are, of course, a risk of inflation and pressures also created from that. Um, and that is another factor that the Fed will need to, to sort of take account of. But I am not as convinced as some that we are actually in for another significant wheel up in terms of stock prices. Because if you look at fundamental value, even if you look at fundamental value in the the magnificence, magnificent seven. It's really pretty extreme at the moment, and of course, markets are tending to trend value based on expectations of of earnings ahead. But as the U.S. economy does appear to be slowing, it may well be that those earnings are actually overstated too. So I think there's definitely a question as to whether markets can go higher again, and that actually Tony takes us to a question that came in through four or five people prior to the show, which was about asset protection. Now, in this environment where you've got massively high house prices, massively high stocks relative to, to fundamentals, um, how do you actually protect? I mean, what is the strategy or is there a strategy 
that you could adopt to provide some protection, you know, against these adverse movements? What do you think? I think, um, look, I'm not a bond guy. I'll, um, I'll, be, I'll be straight up. Uh, could, could government bonds again become popular? Uh, I, I know that a, a lot out there are averse to the risk of, of precious metals. Uh, you can find ways uh, to invest in, in precious metals. As I've said, since the 1970s, they've actually maintained some form of purchasing power. Obviously, you've got you've got third party risk there. For those more risks, so you look at bonds. Uh, basically, with property prices, again, I know we've got the spruikers saying they're going to be high forever. Um, it's like when Irving Fisher said in 1929 that stocks had reached a permanently high plateau, and I think again that's that's what we're looking at. So. I know we've all got to find somewhere to live, but that really, with the rental crisis, that makes that a lot harder. So you look at bonds, um, term deposits. Again, you have to be careful, obviously, of third-party risk and the level of protection that the government provides. Uh, would I look towards the blue chip stocks? I, I think they've they've performed well. The banks here, the major resource companies, have held up well. Uh, again. You can maybe look at some ETFs, conservatively look at some ETFs. We do have ETFs in Australia that bet for the market and against the market and can provide a broad mix of companies. Uh, there's now some ETFs, I think better shares now have zero fee ETFs and it's very cost effective. But again, uh, when markets head in one direction, you do tend to have these being as crowded places. But, but I think... Um, most out there are ultra conservative. They will sit on the cash. They will save cash, and they're not going to be huge spenders. So I, my strategy is obviously in tune with my level of risk, which says that some of these small companies with big potential are trading like beachfront properties in Sydney back in the nineties. So you've got bonds. You've got a mixture of cash. Do you look at emerging markets? Uh, again, again, tough, tough going. Uh, I, I hear at conferences that Vietnam and Indonesia are going to be the next powerhouse economies. Do you allocate some money to them? Uh, do you believe that India can overcome its superstitions and, and become a powerhouse? Again, a much higher level of risk. But I don't like the risk reward of the ASX 200 at the moment. I don't like the risk reward of the Dow, S&P and, and the NASDAQ. So you, there are mechanisms to do that. Uh, or you can just simply go, go for yield. Um, you can buy high yielding companies, but there's been generally no greater wealth destruction than, than in the hunt for yield. But again, you've got to be cognizant that, that asset prices are going to fall. And you might find yourself averaging down for a few years until things turn around. But I just think this phenomenon of massively overhyped and overpriced markets, it can start to head towards the norm. And unfortunately, as I've witnessed in my sector for two years, it can overshoot to the downside. And once sentiment's against it, uh, geez, it's hard to get out of it, Martin. So yeah, there's some strategies. I, I think that uh, individuals should should get some advice. Uh, I know a lot of lot of viewers uh, have been around for quite some time, and they've built up wealth. There are ways to protect it, I guess, with using limited leverage, and that's what some of these ETFs can provide. And again, uh, do your research into it. Do I look at any other art classes? Do I look towards um, crypto? Obviously, uh, Bitcoin ha has performed. The rest of that sector. No one talks about it anymore. I know Richard Hart's in a world of pain over what he's done. Um, I need to watch um, his his documentary uh, because you know these. What every bubble does is bring out gurus and people that are going to change the world. And a, a lot, sadly, were the thirteenth man on the deal team. So that that's my. I think a lot of viewers, yeah, you know, will stick to the conservative methods. Um, they will have have some cash which obviously for savers and retirees is starting to perform 
with high rates. But um, again, the bond market has been blowing up and might be worth revisiting. So anyway, that's that's the more conservative strategy. Um, for me, I'll sit on my precious metals. I will look at my companies that will hopefully just put out good news, do their bloody job and get re-rated. I'm hoping for a swathe of M&As in the mining and, and biotech sector. So I, I think exciting times and probably fundamental investors turn to shine when other markets have just been driven by uh, money laundering, FOMO and lax, lax controls. Thank you, Tony. And it was an interesting question. Jump for Joy uh, asked this question a little while ago, and thanks for the super chat. Looking to start accumulating one of the bear hedge funds for protection, BBUZ or BBOZ? Does Tony have a preference one over the other, and if so, why? Well, I think uh, if, okay, so it's BBUS and BBOZ. So they're uh, better shares products. Uh, I should reiterate, I have no commercial agreement with them. Uh, the the BBUS uh, has come down from about thirteen dollars. It's now trading around seven. They did pay a distribution a couple of years ago. Um, do you really look to bet against which country cuts rates first? Uh, is that going to be the US? I I certainly would rather, uh, rightly or wrongly, I, I'd bet against the US first. I we can always can't discount the potential for Australia to become a bit of a safe haven, Martin. And can Australian price earnings ratios enjoy an expansion that that has happened in the US? I know it's hard to see a bubble when you're not in one, but um, for mine, uh, the BBUS could pay off. And if you're looking for the ASX 200 to decline, uh, you can also look at that. There is a extremely highly leveraged product out there this is for only those that like living on the living in the fast lane and that's snaz uh the cody sierra november alpha sierra and that bets against the nasdaq and that is very volatile um it's probably a trading counter if if you're keen to sell it when the nasdaq goes through its correction and uh, buy it back when when the Nasdaq's on a bit of a tear. But th those products out there, they're not for everyone. But again, uh, do 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 some research, get into them. I know my clients have used them, um, some very successfully uh, to trade those those ranges. But um, you know who who forecast um, U.S. markets up over twenty percent with what's going on in the world. Well, that's right, which is why we said a little while ago that the markets are relatively fully valued, I think, and therefore you've got to sort of be a little bit uh, coy and caref careful at the moment. Um, one of the other observations, of course, is that um, uh, over, over recent times, you know, the reversal that we saw really happened in October, November, December. So, you know, this, this is a relatively compressed time frame. And it was all very much to do with what the Fed said with regard to interest rates and uh, all of those things. So you wonder how much it's really based on hopium rather than reality. And I, I, I still am of the view that there's a lot of hopium out there and there's a lot of uh, you know, market dynamics. And by the way, of course, a lot of um, the market participants make money on every trade. So actually, they want more trading. So that's another thing to bear in mind. Um, and yet, of course, you can, if you look at things like term deposits, I know they're boring. You know, they're reasonable rates at the moment, although um, I will argue that probably in Australia, they probably peaked and, and, and may come may come down a little um, ahead, but who knows? Um, but I guess that's the point. You know, there are a few alternatives, but it's a question of whether you want certainty, whether you want growth, uh, whether you want asset protection. So what I find, Tony, quite often is that uh, investors are a little bit confused about what they want from their portfolio. And that, of course, then leads to mixed decisions and mixed signals. For sure. And, you know, Portfolios end up being balanced where your top performing assets balance out your losers. I think we all go for far too much diversification. We get too many tips. Uh, we end up with, a, a, you know, race 10 at Wentworth Park. And I, I think that um, that I'm probably not the right person to talk about more conservative measures because 
I'm, I'm a speculator and my clients are speculators, but at least we've got a grasp on what's happening in, in the world, uh, where markets are. And, you know, as we've seen, markets can remain overpriced where they have been. You, you look <laughs> at property prices in particular, you look at the US indices and other sectors of the market can be in the doldrums. And, and I think that that sector is never going to have any upside but, you know, it's like the newlywed couple not trying to break bodily functions in front of each other. Once, once the dam breaks, it's on for young and old. And again, once people start to sell, selling pressure begets selling pressure. And, you know, you look at uh, a recent report from the US, Nike shares down 11.8% yeah. on consumer spending. And the other index, the underwear index, there's been a lot of publicity on that, that, um, in financially tough times, people don't splurge on new underwear. Um, you know, that's a bit bit disgusting. And Gillette always had the razor blade index. Uh, amazingly, if you if you buy a razor block um, and sharpen your blades, that can last for months. And so, again, we're not going out. We don't feel that great to go out and splurge on underwear and razor blades. So that shows that consumer spending is going to slow. Uh, you look at you look at JB Hi-Fi and Harvey Norman and all those stores. Um, let's see how retail sales um, come off. But retail is just a component of, of markets. Would I be in discretionary spending stocks? No. Uh, you look at Woolworths. Woolworths has traded like a growth stock for years. And it's not priced as a supermarket chain. It's priced like a, like a NASDAQ stock in some cases. So very confusing for those in the investment world. But again, you're looking at you're looking at asset classes that in some cases are 50% overvalued. And I just can't see this going on with interest rates where they are, regardless. No, no relief. Um, we're gonna have an, a plethora of other issues to come through. And this is, you know, you've got to look at food bank, you've got to look at the credit helplines, you've got to look at insurance fraud. And I just think it's that the the problems, even though we've had we've had a Christmas period, we've all most of us have had a lot to drink. We all feel suddenly cheery. Uh, you know, we've actually pretended to like family over the last few days. Maybe not for everyone, but I think um, it doesn't take much for hostilities to be back on, and potentially in in Australian markets. Uh, the, the belief is most stockbrokers won't come back till after the Australia Day holiday and you'll see a lot of deals happen then. You're seeing a lot of deals happen in the mid-cap space of biotech industrial companies. Other larger sharks coming in and paying well over and I think that's going to be a recurring theme. So, you know, is there going to be a hot sector? Are people going to overbid on a unit in Leichhardt with no parking space? Um, are the Chinese going to keep buying these properties? Are Eastern states investors going to ramp up their buying splurge in Perth? And is all the capital going to come west? Um, I think there's a lots, lots of questions. And again, um, there's no friends when it comes to money and it's every family for themselves. And I've certainly taken measures, as I've mentioned. I'm not ashamed to say that I've had a tough couple of years, but there's much better times ahead for me. And where I've had to watch everyone else dine out, um, you know, that's hopefully it's going to be my turn. And um, no doubt with the service you've provided, Martin, and the Tarek, Tarek's um, events, oh, Jesus, I mean, this is such a great channel. And I thank everyone for um, coming on board. Well, Tony, I appreciate your, your, your thoughts and your presentation. And, uh, you know, it, it'll be a really interesting year. I think um, who knows how it's going to play out. There are clearly risks out there. And, uh, you know, depending on your risk appetite, whether you're a, a speculator, a trader versus um, somebody looking for uh, long term protection, you're going to have different strategies and different, and different um, ideas about where to go. But uh, I guess the message from tonight's show is if you thought 2023 was um, a crazy year, there's, <laughs> there's no chance that 2024 won't have some surprises. Um, you know, it could be upside surprises, could be downside surprises. So I guess what it says is um, you need to watch the signs and hopefully we'll be able to continue on this channel to, to share some of the thoughts and opinions from a range of people who are in the know as to what's going on. And um 
you know, I look forward to having you back in, in the new year and, and tracking how 2024 goes. Um, I actually think that the idea of um, spreading the risks across the market and, you know, putting your toes into the more speculative end of the market, providing you know that there's risk, of course, if you go wrong, but if you can get upside, that's great. But probably you wouldn't put all of your savings all into that speculative end. On the other hand, if you just go just on term deposits, well, maybe a little more secure, but then maybe the returns could be more secure but lower. And that's the trade-off that people have to make when they try and build a portfolio. And that's why people need to get specific financial advice, which, of course, we can't give on the channel. No. No. And, uh, you know, I, I think the other advantage is get, get, your, get your kids educated, um, get them get them started into it. Uh, this is this is the time where you can teach them about what's going on in the world. You can teach them uh, discipline. Um, you know, even even for a start, I know it's probably not that popular. Get them on the raise app, where part of their money gets invested. They they see small growth in investments, and it can round out up their purchases passive purchases, and suddenly they're starting to build a nest egg and they can see it all on an app just simple measures like that get them involved in the stock market even if you buy etfs or blue chip shares i just think this this generation uh unless property prices halve quick smart are going to struggle to buy any houses or anywhere to live basically when interest rates are high and their level that they can borrow has been greatly reduced so yeah get get the young people involved um, work out how to how you can raise some money somehow. Um, exactly, I, I just think yeah, it's gonna the world financial world goes on. There's gonna be bad years, but um, you know when when the good years come, squirrel some away and um, horses for courses. Everyone's got their own strategy and yeah. Spot on. Well, Tony, I want to say thank you very much. Uh, we'll uh, pull the show to a close now. I think um, yeah. I ran a, a live show yesterday with Edwin, which uh, went on a bit. And uh, we've got um, um, more than a thousand views uh, so far. So that's great. Thank you all for those who are uh, been watching the show. Please like and subscribe. Um, I've put Tony Lacantro's uh, URL in the, um, mm. in the show notes as well. So you can go across and sign up over there to get Tony's some um, thoughts. And um, yeah. where it's... Um, Pick up again down the track, Tony. Look forward to, to that uh, as we go into 2024. And um, I want to say thank you very much for us taking some of your Boxing Day to um, uh, come and chat to us here. Any last thoughts before we sign off? Yeah, I've, I've mashed up a, a saying. Uh, it's only in the strongest sunlight that we all realise that we truly suck at cleaning windows. Tony Lacantro <laughs> signing off. <laughs> uh, brilliant, Tony. That's a wonderful way to sign. Thank you very much. I'm going to take you offline now and uh, I'll just uh, close the show. Uh, we'll see you uh, down the track and uh, have a good 2024. Thanks, Tony. Thanks, Martin. Thanks, viewers. Okay, so there we are, folks. Hope you enjoyed that. And uh, great to have Tony on again. Always uh, worth listening to him. And uh, he always shares some um, from the heart, which is which is great. Just to say that uh, next Tuesday we'll be on again. And I'll be back on with Damien Classen. He'll be reviewing again 2023, but also thinking about 2024 from a sort of a core investment perspective. So that should be worth um, following. And... Um, well, the dogs are a bit all over the place, but uh, uh, at least uh, <laughs> Luna's there. Meteor's tucked around the corner, so I can't show her, but then well, there's Luna. Um, but I want to say thank you very much for uh, coming on two nights in a row, many people. And uh, for those who missed last night with um, uh, Edwin, it's there up in replay. Um, I'll be making shows over the next few days and obviously back next week for a live. So have a very, very good period between Christmas and New Year. Always a bit weird, but um, enjoy those uh, few days. And I hope that uh, 2024 uh, works for all of you. And uh, don't forget DFA, come back and uh, spend some time with us again. Uh, we'll be here and uh, talking about the uh, markets as they develop, talking about housing and property and all those other uh, things. I've got some plans also for some new guests and also to bring a bit more content uh, from other places as well as uh, continuing to focus very firmly on Australia. So this is Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics signing off and uh, have a good evening. We'll see you next time. Cheerio.